right, good morning those who are joining us online for worship. Uh, we welcome you to White Branch Church uh, via the internet. And now we're moving into a time of singing. Our opening song this morning is number two, My Father's World, as uh, my Aunt Jenny leads singing. See, it didn't say for Jenny. It's <laughs> good. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and around me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, a wrestling the thought of rocks and trees. the perishing. Yes. 
Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Dustin, for leading us in worship today. And I always appreciate Ron being willing to jump in and help us with these slides. So scripture reading today is Exodus chapter 21, verses 12 through 25. Anyone who kills a man and kills him, or anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. However, if he does not do it intentionally, but God lets it happen, he is to flee to a place I will designate. But if a man schemes and kills another man deliberately, take him away from my altar and put him to death. Anyone who attacks his father or his mother must be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps another and either sells him or still has him when he is caught must be put to death. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. If men quarrel and one hits another with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but is confined to bed, the one who struck the blow will not be held responsible if the other gets up and walks around outside with his staff. However, he must pay the injured man for the loss of his time and see that he is completely healed. If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two since the slave is his property. If men who are fighting hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Good morning. You're like, oh, that was a very encouraging and uplifting scripture reading. Thank you very much today. I told you it's going to be a challenge. I have never preached from the law before, uh, the law of Moses, and this is a bit challenging, but I'm going to give you my best effort. But before I do, let's give you a few more bullets and bloopers. The morning sermon, Jesus walks on water. Sermon tonight, searching for Jesus. <laughs> Outreach committee has enlisted 25 members to make calls on people who are not afflicted with any church. The third verse will be sung without musical accomplishment. And next Sunday, we will have a soloist for the morning service. The pastor will speak about the terrible experience. <laughs> so today uh, is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And we talk about Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Let me talk about why we have this day. Uh, January 22nd, 1984. <laughs> President Ronald Reagan issued a presidential proclamation designating the third Sunday of January as National Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. It was in response to the decision on January 22nd, 1973, by the Supreme Court of Roe v. Wade. Amazingly, 49 years later, or in the 50th year, which the Bible calls the year of Jubilee, uh, this was overturned. June 24, 2022, with the Dobbs versus Jackson decision. Now, each state gets to decide what to do with abortion. I believe this was a major step in the right direction. That said, we still have a lot of work to do in helping people recognize the sanctity of human life, both born and not yet born. So when we talk about the sanctity of human life, I figure this fits perfectly with our theme this year. Our theme is a year of holiness. So when we look at this word sanctity, it's in the same thread. Holy, sacred, sanctity, all of these cover the same things. So what makes human life sacred? Why is a human sacred? When we talk about the sanctity of human life, we have to have a reason. If I think something is sacred or I call something sanctity, there's a reason. So what makes human life sacred? It's because we have been created by a holy creator. We've been created by a holy creator. And if you take that out, I don't believe you have a basis at all for a sanctity of human life. The preamble to our Declaration of Independence, which a lot of our nation's Laws and foundings and everything comes from says this. We hold these truths to be self-evident. And I think two things in that opening statement are really important to recognize. 
truth, and self-evident. In other words, we think that this is true and self-evident for all people for all time. And what is that truth? That all men, or we might say today, all humans, are created equal. And they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So if we are created by our creator, that's why we have these, these rights. In fact, I've said many times, we'll continue to say that our nation is a Judeo Christian nation in the fact that we were based on the principles of the Old and New Testament. And again, I'm not going to argue today for a word for word application. This word for word application was to be used in the nation of Israel with their covenant prior to the coming of Christ. But there are principles here of which we base continuing life on. And what is that? All people are created by their creator with unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And today I'm focusing on the first one, our right to life. We have an unalienable right to life. Why? Because the creator created us. So I believe that's the first, the foundation, and the fundamental right that we build everything else on. Psalm 139, 13 to 16 says, You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now this is speaking of the Lord. You created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. That's an understanding of being made in the image and the likeness of God. That's an understanding of having a sacredness to your life. Jeremiah 1.5. Before, this is God speaking now to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God was already at work in the womb, creating and calling this life. So I believe from these two scriptures, we see even in the womb, God is at work forming and shaping and calling people with a holy purpose. So God is the creator of all human life. And because God is holy, he creates all human life. I believe that makes it sacred. Let me give you a couple more scriptures here about that. Genesis 1, 26. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now, God did not say that about anything else God created. There's only one thing God created where he said, you are made in my likeness and you are made in my image, and that's humanity. Yes, God created everything and everything was good. He said, that was good, that was good, that was good. And when he finished, he said it was very good, and mankind was made distinct and special in his image. In fact, this is not a biological definition, but a theological one, but I think is true. What makes a human a human? A human is one made in the image of God. Anything not made in the image of God is not human. Anything made in the image of God is a human. And notice part of the definition of holy. Holy. Set apart, special for his purposes. But part of the definition is also above. Notice here that they may rule over. There is a hierarchy in God's creation that they may rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, over the creatures that move along the ground. God says, I created humanity as holy and above. In my likeness, in my image. God didn't say that about anything else in creation. So human life is special. Human life is different than anything else in creation. Human life is holy. So verse 27 we see again, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God is the one who makes human life holy. God is the one that makes human life sacred. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. That's only material. 
and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, now spiritual and material. Wind, breath, and spirit, the same word in the Greek and the Hebrew, God breathed the breath of life. God put his spirit into the dust, and it came alive. So a human being is not just physical. This is why we must teach and proclaim these truths, that all people are created by their creator in the image and likeness of God as unique, special, and holy. God is the creator, and he has created us. Now, over the years, many in our culture have taught and advocated for an atheistic, secular, materialistic world. And in that world, there is no divine creator. It's all material. It's all without a creator. And if that's true, there is no sanctity to human life. There is nothing that makes human life sacred if there's no holy creator. It's one of the major clashes of our worldview that I'll be talking about in Bible study tomorrow. If you take out God, you don't have any sacredness to human life. If we are merely a physical being, if we are merely the product of uh, atheistic evolution, then we are not sacred. There is nothing holy and sacred about us. And if that is also true, there is no absolute morals for everybody for all time. It's all relative to people and their society and their social construct. And therefore it can change from culture to culture and from generation to generation. I'm arguing the opposite of both of those. That we are created divine by our creator, and that creator has given us a moral standard for all people for all time. And that doesn't change. So I believe that part of the purpose of the law is to remind us of God's holy standard for his people for all time. So when we look at this from Exodus, <clears throat> excuse me, 21 to 25, I believe we are seeing a principle of the sanctity of human life. And I don't believe we should extract all those verses and apply them word for word now. But the principle remains, human life is sacred. Genesis 9 is actually the first law God gives after the flood. And in verse 5, he says, And for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. In other words, the first basic law that I'm going to establish is the life of another human being must be protected. And he says in verse 6, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. So this creates another dilemma we'll have to walk through here. If shedding human blood is wrong, <laughs> then how does another human shed their blood as the punishment? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But first, I want you to see that the very first law, the very first thing that God wants to protect is human life. And the very first justice that he brings is that human life for the life. Now, notice again the reason. For, in the image of God, has God made mankind. The reason for that is because they are made in the image of God. That's why the first thing that God does is to protect the human life. So if we think about it, that's the first and foundational right. It's the first and foundational law for protection of humanity. And then God sets up a retribution or a system or a justice for doing that. Romans 13 talks about in verse 4, For one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. So God has established human government to bring justice for those who take human life. So questions remain. Does that mean the death penalty should be used in all cultures at all times? Is that still a good thing? Or is there other ways of having retribution? Regardless, we know this. Human life is to be protected. Sometimes there is a breakdown of how you consider human life being taken. The biblical theology commentary says homicide begins the social laws as the most important such law. 
because the transcendent value of human life cannot be compromised by anything on this earth. And then study.com says there are differences between homicide, murder, and manslaughter, and our legal system identifies this today. Homicides are any death caused by one person killing another. Murder is homicide that takes place with premeditation. Manslaughter is homicide that takes place in the heat of passion. In other words, legally, we recognize some differences on how and when human life is taken. That's actually what Exodus says here. If you go back to Exodus 21.12, it says, anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Verse 13, however, if he does not do it intentionally, he is to flee to the place I will designate. 14, but if a man schemes and kills another man deliberately, take him away from my altar and put him to death. Notice there, God seems to make a distinction on how they should be treated. If it's a premeditated murder versus something that happens in the moment. But either way, human life is valued, and that's the point here. And either way, there should be some sort of legal retribution. So we keep going here, verse 15. Anyone who attacks his father or mother must be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps another. Notice here we recognize the value of human life is also identified in verse 16. That kidnapping or human trafficking is also devaluing the human life that God has created. And he says, if he kidnaps another and sells him or still has him when he is caught, must be put to death. Now, 17 obviously seems harsh. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. I wouldn't advocate for that in our current legal system. But again, there's a valuing and honoring of the father and the mother. And that's in the Ten Commandments, which we'll talk about next week. So we see here all through this, uh, 18, if men quarrel and one hits another with a stone or with his fist, he does not die, but is confined to bed. The one who struck the blow will not be held responsible if the other gets up and walks around. But he must pay the injured man for the loss of his time and see that he's completely healed. In other words, you still have to recognize there's value in that life. Even though he didn't die, you have injured and made that person suffer, and you have to do something to help that person. And then even a slave... And even though 21 talks about the slave being his property, we see in 20, if a man beats his male or female slave with a rod and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. Even that human slave in a society that upheld slavery recognized that they have inherent value, that they are created in the image and the likeness of God. So we see here then if uh, 23, if there's serious injury or take life for life, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. In other words, equal retribution. They weren't to go beyond what was given. You can't take someone's life away if they only took your arm. <laughs> it's equal retribution. So how do we deal with this today? What do we do? We're, obviously, I'm not advocating for taking these verses and applying them directly. But the first thing I want us to see, number one, is the principle that all human life, born or not yet born, is sacred and made in God's image. I think that's the first thing we should take away from today. All human life is sacred and made in God's image. And God made some laws for his people to show how to respond to the taking of human life. Now, in our culture today, we can decide how to best deal with these issues. But I think that we need to recognize that all human life, number two, is to be protected. Number three, that laws are needed to protect human life and bring justice to those who take it away. Again, we can debate what those laws should be. We can debate how to best do that in our culture today. But we need to recognize laws are needed to protect human life and bring justice to those who take it away. Now, number four, this is for us as believers. I want you to see something. Jesus wants us to go beyond equal retribution to showing mercy. Jesus quotes this in Matthew 5, 38. He said, you have heard it said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. He's quoting this scripture. It was their law in their culture. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. 
If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He says, let's go beyond equal retribution. Let's go to showing mercy. Jesus gives us a different type of application for this on a personal level. I'm not saying we shouldn't have legal justice, but as an individual... He says, don't aim for equal retribution in your personal life. Aim for showing mercy. And then Matthew 5, 21 to 22, we see also here that Jesus wants to go beyond the outward, and he wants us to begin to change our hearts. Matthew 5, uh, 21. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, but anyone who murders be subject to judgment. Again, that's what we just read about. But I tell you, anyone who's angry with a brother or sister be subject to judgment. So you see how he goes beyond the outward act of murder and into your heart. He wants to begin to change your heart. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, which is a term of contempt in their culture, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, be in danger of the fire of hell. In other words, Jesus says, I want to deal with your heart, now I want to deal with your mouth, not just the taking of a human life. So the only way that can happen is by being born again and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because in our natural human flesh, we can't change our heart. Our heart, even if we don't outwardly commit these things, will still be bent towards sin and evil. So Ephesians 4 talks about how to do this through the Holy Spirit. In your anger, do not sin. Now, anger itself is not sin, but in our anger, we don't want to choose sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the foothold to the devil. In other words, if you harbor that anger and you build that anger and you strengthen that anger, you're giving the devil a foothold to respond his way. Instead, in 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and brawling and slander along with every form of malice. 432, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And that last phrase, we recognize the glory of the New Testament. On the cross, Jesus forgave us. So we are already forgiven. We don't have to try to be good enough to be forgiven. We don't have to try to be loving enough to be forgiven. We don't have to say, God, I've got this anger in my heart and I need to get rid of it so I can be right with you. Instead, it's the opposite. God, you've already forgiven me. You've already made me right with you. And you know I'm dealing with this anger. Now help me to forgive like you have forgiven me. We are righteous while we're angry. (laughs) We are righteous while we have hatred in our heart. Not because we've done enough right, but because Jesus has already forgiven us. And when we take that anger, we take that hatred to the Lord or to brothers and sisters to pray for us and to help us to get through these things, we are doing it while we're already forgiven. We're doing it while we're already righteous, which is how we operate in the new covenant. So I want you to recognize that you're righteous by grace and through faith, by Jesus giving his life for you, you're forgiven by him, and now because that Holy Spirit lives in you, because the spirit of forgiveness lives in you, because the spirit of mercy and love lives in you, you can say, Holy Spirit, help me to live your way and respond in your way of heart, not in the way of anger and frustration and hatred. So here's my challenges for you. Number one, I would encourage you, Pray for and contribute to a pregnancy care center or another pro-life organization. Finances, volunteer, give items for a few years. I was on the board of the Henry County Pregnancy Care Center. That's one avenue you can give. I would put uh, Mahali Pama Isha and Dave and Jen under this as well, as they are rescuing infants and giving them life. Sacred lives that have been left out there by people who did not want them. Number two, I would encourage you to pray, consider voting for and supporting pro-life legislation, noting that in our world today, we have to debate what's the best way to handle that. But behind that, we know valuing human life is important. Number three, pray for a heart that values life, 
forgives others, and shows mercy. Pray for God to do that in your life. And then number four, if you have not yet received God's gift of eternal and abundant life for you through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Everyone who can hear this, I want you to know your life is sacred. Your life is valued. You are loved by your creator. Jesus in John 10, 10 says, the thief that comes to steal and to kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus gave up his holy life so that we could receive life. Your life is valued and you are loved. He gave his life for you so that you could have life. Let's pray. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus and the sanctity of human life someday. And God, we recognize that you're our creator and you have created us in your image and likeness. And God, you value all of us. We are all sacred and special to you. You gave your life so that we could have life. So that we could be forgiven, God, of all of our things that we've done wrong. All of our hatred, all of our wrong thoughts, all of our wrong actions, all the ways we have hurt people. God, even if we have literally murdered people, you can forgive that and cleanse us today and change our hearts. And God, I pray that we receive your grace today and your forgiveness. And God, give us grace to love others. Give us grace to forgive as you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you all please stand with me. We're going to sing Because He Lives, page 122. <clears throat>
your life and your life is sacred. He values all human life. Be blessed today by the creator who makes you special to him. God bless you. <laughs>